Hello and welcome once again to Beyond the Game. I am Kendall Gammon, joined as always by Lamont Winston, the OG of player development. In this, we of course talk about the game outside of the lines when the clock has stopped running. What's going on with NFL players when they're away from the facility or when they're away from a game time during the year? As always, again, Lamont Winston. Lamont, great to have you. Kendall, it's great to be on the show again. Um, Hope the weather's good back there where you are. It's absolutely fantastic here in Florida. Um, you know, there's uh, still a lot going on. The National Football League, that thing is ramping up. Uh, it's getting close. They got the schedules. They, they're they in the mini camp. I mean, they're in the last phase of OTAs. Um, guys have gotten paid. Rookies. Yeah. Guys have gotten paid. So there's a lot uh, going on uh, in the National Football League for sure. Yeah, no doubt. And I should mention also our guest today, a former 16-year center in the NFL, member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, inducted in 2019, Kevin Mawai. Uh, this is, this is uh, and I think you can attest to this also, uh, Lamont, this is about as solid of an individual as you will find in this world. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, Kevin is, you look at, you know, Will Shields, you know, yeah. you look right at Kevin Mawai. I mean, those, mm-hmm. they, they live their lives the right way. They approach their work the right way, uh, They, which, which in turn, uh, they influence the people around them in the same ways. And so um, I'm thrilled to have him uh, 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 as a guest. Um, Kevin spent some time with my brother, Kevin, at yeah. the time with the New York Jets together. And, and he would always rave about you know, Kevin's leadership. So, um, yeah, he's a fantastic person. I'm excited to hear from him. And as always, we thank our listeners for uh, being with us today. Lamont, I just want to get this in, though. If people wanted to follow you on Twitter, what would your handle be for they could go and follow you? At, at, at Lamont Winston. At Lamont Winston. Okay, just like me, at Kendall Gammon. So, yeah. folks, if you're out there and you want to do that, that, that would be awesome. Love to hear from you. So, okay, you said a lot of different things. Let's start with this one first. OTAs, phase three. So the guys are in their helmets. They've got what we call shells, which are just kind of these pads um, they shouldn't be necessary because there's no contact, but they need to be necessary because there is some contact. And um, I think they can be on the field a, a couple hours a day. They can still lift uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half, something like that, run together and then have meetings. So it is ramped up a little bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they, uh, it's like you said, it's, uh, it's maybe two hand touch. But yeah. you know, when you get when you get people that weigh 300 pounds and 260 pounds running around, it's kind of hard to just two hand touch. But uh, what really is interesting though is with what the what the young guys, the rookies, start to experience now is the pace, the speed, yeah. even in a drill, right? Like like the the, the pace, the intensity of a, of, of a technique uh, drill is how it goes. Um, the other part is they're learning up this, they're learning about the pace in the classroom. Like those meetings yeah. now, like when they say they meet, they meet, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and they have walkthroughs in there that they go in the field, they go back in the class. So there's some intense learning going on right now. And I think yeah. these youngsters are challenging, they're being challenged with information uh, overload. And then at the same time, the physicalness of working against veterans at yeah. that speed in those situations, I think that's uh, uh, that's something I think our fans don't really take a look at and appreciate, but it's taxing in itself, no doubt. Yeah, and and you bring up a lot of good points. I want to unpack this first because not only were you the, at the head of the player development side, but you came in as a coach and you talked about how much with the playbooks and the guys have to absorb. And, and the coaches, they throw – maybe more than they think they can handle at times, don't they, just to see how they react to it or see what they can actually comprehend? Yeah, so, Kendall, I came in as a, as a scout, but what happened was that we were allowed, as a scout, we were allowed to go to meetings. And, mm-hmm. and so we can now, now assess how, our, how the guys learn, what, what, what's being asked of them. And so when, you, when you're right, when, when they're, the, the coaches do it for a reason, uh, to see just how much you can handle, uh, you know, the other part of it is the recall. As you well know, sometimes they'll install something that you, they, these guys may not see until the end of the training camp. You're, you're exactly right. And it's interesting. If people don't know, I mean, when the rookies come in for rookie camp, they literally go over everything once and then they go back and then they come back for OTAs and then they go through things slower with the whole team. And then after this, at the end of these OTAs will be the 
the normal mini camp where everybody comes in and they'll start over they'll go over a third time and then they'll break and then when they come back to a camp they'll start over and they'll go over it day by day during so you go over it four separate times at different speeds um but it's uh, as you mentioned i can't think of a of a, of a better uh, way to mention it except or describe it is it is a fire hose i mean they're just throwing stuff at you for lack of a better word mm -hmm. yeah and you know it's a uh... And again, it's that recall, like, you know, Kendall, you can talk a little bit about how something is an install and you might get it uh, in mini camp. You might not see it again till, you know, either in the training camp and or maybe the first uh, preseason game or the first regular season game. I mean, but you're expected to to, to kind of know. Right. I mean, what, what exactly yeah. what, they're, what, they're, what they're doing. Correct. Yeah, no, you, you're right about that. And then, you know, the other thing, too, is during these OTAs and everything uh, going on, the learning's huge, but, but you've been out there and you see it, you know, they've got helmets and they've got these, these shells on to just kind of, uh, so there's going to be some bumping and bruising. So they try to, to, to take it on it. And you can find some things out about receivers and defensive backs. Oh, yeah. I and mean, you can even see, you can even see probably how uh, linebackers run, you know, side to side and how they get laterally, but inside you can't do a lot of things, but, the big thing I'm getting at from all the coaches and even more so today, I think is this is the NFL, which they've taken, they've taken the pads out of the practices as much as possible. And for good reason, maybe, or maybe not uh, too much, but the fact is the rules are the rules. So you got to learn how to practice at, at a, at a high tempo without getting into people. And I think that's something that rookies have a little bit of a hard time with as, as well. I think we heard this week, even, I think it's George Koloptis, if I got his name right, but the, the defensive end uh, that, that the chiefs uh, took and it said, Andy Reid, they, they had to tone him down because he's just used, he's got this higher motor and he's used to going all the time. Is that something you love as an edge rusher? Uh, but it's hard when you're talking about these OTAs and trying to figure things out when, when it's not game day, when it's not practice with full pads. Yeah, you know, and, and he's he's probably one of many. Uh, there have been there have been yeah. since um, you know fights, right? And a lot of yeah. times the fights aren't the veterans; these young guys, and you know yeah. they're they're trying to prove themselves. They're trying to go fast. They're coming from college where they they, they didn't know how to they had they didn't practice like this, right? Yeah, um, uh, and so they, they it, you know they their clocks on. They're trying to prove. Uh, not only to usually probably to the players first, but then you know then everybody's around you, right? And so yeah. you know you do have to learn how to practice uh, in the NFL because that this is actually goes into the season because if you can learn how to do it now, they can't bang every day during the season, right? Right? They actually yeah. taper down at at, at at points in the season. So learning yeah. how to le learning how to practice um uh is is important but it's a direct reflection of how much you can actually retain you can learn and retain yeah right you know you brought up another one that i think is very big is you know we're we're into the ot's free agency is over there may be a few stray dogs here and there for different things but for the most part people have gotten paid uh and now all of a sudden it's like okay you've gotten paid you got that contract how are you practicing are you bringing it every day and and most guys do uh, but, but sometimes, you know, there's a tendency you've, I've, I've seen some guys who let up a little bit. They're like, Oh, I, I finally got my contract. And, and quite honestly, that's, that's the opposite. I don't know if that's human nature or not. It wasn't with most people I was around, but it is something you have to watch out for, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, there's guys with big money contracts, they, and they, they're veterans and they, they, they know what the deal is. I, I have to yeah. be able to do my thing, be prepared for training camp. You know, if they, they're healthy, but maybe not quite healthy, right? Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they're trying to get through to uh, that that training camp because then it's the preseason, and then, you know, they're they're trying to play a season, and you don't want to make – you want to make sure that as a veteran, you're putting your, – you're available uh, to, to play because if you're not, then the young guys get the opportunity, right? Yeah. And, and conversely, if you're a young guy, <clears throat> if you're a young guy, you know, you're – you're just trying to go at it, right? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, in terms of money for them, you can't say to your family anymore you don't have money, right? Because, exactly. Uh, you know, if you're a draft yeah. pick and you got signing bonus, there's money. And so 
those guys, when you when they get off the grass, man, I know for a fact that they're dealing with, you know, families are, you know, and, and, and making decisions on things because they do have the money. And it's just like added pressure. Like I, I I'm, I'm trying to, you know, practice. I'm trying to, you know, do all this stuff and not turn around. And, and these relationships in your family are now getting exposed a little bit. Right. Because yeah. when, you do something, when you do tell them no or maybe not right now, now you see how funny people can get. And, and that's taxing on emotionally taxing on guys, right? Um, you know, there's there's so there's guys with with their new dads. Um, yeah. You know, there, there's that. There's guys that, that are dealing with the relationship issues constantly because you know they're so tired now. After a full day, they may not right. be on the phone as much. And if you're not on the phone as much with your wife or significant other, then people tend to think something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Right? No, you're and exactly that, right. That takes you down a whole line another road, right? And so, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's it's a with this ramp up of OTAs uh, to mini camp. There's also a ramp up behind the scenes of living this experience and what's really, really happening. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've covered it well, and I've tried to cover it the best I could and was around for a little bit. But we're going to bring in our guest now, Kevin Mawai, 16-year NFL veteran, inducted into the NFL Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2019. He is an LSU Tiger. That is why Lamont Winston has his LSU Tigers helmet behind him. And, of course, he was a New York Jet for a while as well. So with that, uh, we will bring in Kevin Mawai. Guys, how y'all doing? Very well, Kevin. How's everything? I'm doing great. Uh, my heart was warm when I saw the Jets helmet and the LSU helmet, so I got even more <laughs> excited. So you know, I'm just saying, Kevin, I got to give homage where pay homage where homage is due. Um, you know, I, I you know, for California guy, so my California team growing up was UCLA, but my team has been the Tigers, and so you know, to be able to be around the Tigers and got my names on them from various guys, and so I'm a. I'm a, I'm a buy you a bingo for sure, man. That's I'm loving it. I love it 100. So I bleed. I think they cut my veins. Purple's gonna pour out <laughs> as opposed to red. So I don't know. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, Kevin. For those who don't know, uh, what are you doing these days? I am currently the assistant offensive line coach for the Indianapolis Colts. I'm going into my second year. Um, I got hired in February of 2021. Um, Prior to that, I was at ASU as an offensive analyst for the, the Sun Devil program. And, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Um, empty nester as a dad and yeah. just celebrated 29 years as a husband. Congratulations. And, uh, yes, yeah, congrats. so I'm trying to trying to learn this coaching gig. And I'm enjoying the process and uh, can't wait to see what's ahead for me. Go ahead, Lamont. Oh, okay. So, Kevin, I also <clears throat> want to say, like, you know, you with this Jets helmet, so – you know, you you have you had an opportunity to to work with Herm, correct? At yep. the Jets. Um yep. and, and I'm really apologize for having to be around my brother Kevin Winston. I, I, just, <laughs> no, I just I just I'm just gonna throw that out there to you. Um I'm I'm glad you were able to make it through with him. But uh, also you had an opportunity to work with Herm out at the at, at Arizona State. And and one of the things that as Kendall and I are talking about these rookies and and kind of you know behind the scenes stuff. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, when you first went back to college and behind the scenes, okay, off the grass, you know, dealing with the, 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 the families, you know, the, the, the friends, decision making, that kind of thing of where these young athletes are as they're doing their college thing and then hopefully becoming getting up in the National Football League. Yeah, for, for me, when I retired, I actually got an opportunity to volunteer at Vanderbilt University under Robbie Caldwell. So that was my okay. first stint into college coaching. I had a little hand in the recruiting part and stuff like that and got to be around um, the, a college program. And then I volunteered at LSU uh, a couple of years later. I think it was the year 2013. And then I started training guys, got into, you know, Wanting to, I wanted to be a coach. Things worked out. My daughter went to ASU to swim. Oh, great. Within six yeah. months, Herm got the head job there, and and that was my opportunity. He gave me a chance to be an analyst there. And and by the time from Vanderbilt until 2018, when I got to the ASU, the recruiting process changed dramatically. It's just the way the scene of it worked and um, the, the pull that these kids have on them. And it starts in high school with the social media you know, they got to generate the interest and then they got to generate the stars and all that. You got the parents hyping them. They have like uh, a third party coach hyping them. 
And so they're already dealing with a lot of people in their lives that are, have a lot of voices and they got to it's, it's difficult enough as it is as an adult to make decisions. But now you're a young 18, you know, 17 to 18 year old looking to go to college, having to hear even more voices. And then, of course, everybody's on social media. So that just amplifies the number of people and voices that have opinions that they got to filter through. And um, and, and then, of course, you know, you get to the NFL. And their biggest process is, do I come out early? Do I stay in? Should I get drafted, you know, or, or should I transfer because I got a better opportunity to play somewhere else? And and so with the advent of all the technology that's helped us in our lives, it's actually added a burden on mm-hmm. people's lives as well, particularly young kids and young adult men who are trying to make lifelong decisions, you know, whether it be recruiting, um, you know, recruiting decisions to get transferred out or going to the portal, not portal, or to declare for the draft. And um, there's a lot of different things that can entice them. The money's obviously one big deal, the opportunity for riches and fame. And and unfortunately for a lot of them, it, it, it's a smack of reality because um, sometimes a lot of them have an overinflated uh, vision of who they are as a player or capabilities wise. And so I've seen it all. And even as a personal and personally dealt with issues with family and, you know, finances and things like mm-hmm. that. So because of where I've been as a player and issues I've had to deal with in my life, it's become easy to come more of a mentor for these guys to help help them find clarity in all that noise, if you will. Now, before you talk about some of that, <laughs> I just want to go backwards just a second. I mean, I know it's a ways back. It's a ways back for us all. Uh, but can you rem- remember when you came out and you were going to that first rookie mini camp, and then when you were in uh, voluntary uh, workouts in the off season? Uh, um, absolutely, it's like like yesterday, and I'm yeah. sitting in here. You know, we had six rookies in in our rookie class, one draft pick, one, and a couple of free agent guys, and I'm just asking them questions like, "What's it like? What are some of the things you're dealing with?" And and it and it really doesn't change. The generation has changed but the issues are still going to be mm-hmm. the same it may be different levels and you know different um notoriety from a publicity standpoint but they're all the same but i remember like yesterday i remember sitting in the house when i got drafted had my family um you know there was some talk of expectations and then um then you get drafted and there's family expectations then i was a draft i was a you know was a, a second rounder so there was expectations coming from the football side that I had to worry about. And then you had expectations or challenges from veterans on the team. Now, Kendall, when you and I came in, we came in on the back end of old school football where the veterans yeah. weren't really likely to help you out or try to, you know, so man, your playbook is your deal. You need to figure it out um, and that kind of stuff. And so you really had to find a way to make yourself fit and um, and earn your position, earn your spot, especially with the older guys. And um, But I remember things in training camp having to deal with like, you know, the rookie stuff and, you know, the hazing part of it. And of course you always got the one or two veterans that are, are worried or challenged by the fact that they drafted you to take their position. And, mm. and so there's a lot of stuff that goes into all that, that, you know, you just got to find a way to, to handle it and, and listen to the right voices. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, Kevin, like, like, <clears throat> let's, let's, let's slow it down a little bit. Like you talk, we'll go back to this college college thing, because I think, you know, you like I said, you were at you were at Vanderbilt, you were at LSU, you know, you had A, you know, and, and you're watching all this go on. The numbers double almost pretty much, right? So yep. you go, you guys have a hundred plus kids in your in your in a in a, in a power five program. Um, once they're there, how do you ma- how do you guys manage all of that stuff between the social media stuff, the family, guys coming in that were, you know, five star, one star. And then they get to your place, and then it's still a reality because they got to play, right? Um, yep. it, it, they find out they're not as good as they thought they were. But how did you guys manage all of that, um, uh, besi- all that off the field stuff? I mean, how do you have a? Did, did they have player development in at those co- uh, programs? I mean, did the coaches buy into it? Did the players buy into it? Fortunately for me, when when I was at Vanderbilt, we had, you know, Robbie Caldwell was a great coach, great personality, and he had some young guys on staff that would help develop players in that area, do player development and, and things like that. Um, was you know, I know LSU did, but I didn't know much about that because I was in and out. I, I love a volunteer. I didn't, I didn't pull the, the 80 hours a week with those guys. And then um, at Vanderbilt, we did. We had player development engagement where we'd have, like, 
you know, they'd have you know, mandatory um, developmental seminars, whatever it be, right. finances, mm-hmm. dealing with public pressure, dealing with media, and it was like a weekly thing. So there was there were things put in place for our players to handle those situations that they would be put in. And we've actually seen some of them play out in real life because of that, and 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 you know real examples of, of how we you know this was guy's example of how he did it the right way. This is a good example of how you did it the wrong way, and and you know not make it a bad or good thing, just make it these are life lessons that, that your whole team can learn from them. And and you know those guys, at, particularly at ASU, did a really good job with that. Uh, you talk about being at ASU, and obviously Herm is somebody I played for as well. I think I know the answer, but I want to ask you about it in, germ- in terms of you talk about the coaches having to buy in, and I would imagine that that Herm you know, bought in about as much as any head coach could because I know when I played for him, this was a guy that certainly cared for people. He did, and Herm's, Herm's a people's person, and he's a player's mm-hmm. coach, and and some people don't like that term from coaching standpoint, but what that means is he has a vibe for his players and he listens to their voices. And when you have a solid core of, of, of veterans in the NFL or or old upperclassmen type right. leader guys in a college setting, then and you trust those guys, you develop the rapport with them that you can trust them, that, that you can ask them a question, they can give you good and honest mm-hmm. feedback, then you can adjust however you need to to where you want to take your program. And, um, you know, Herm, Herm's an easy guy to like, and he's an easy guy to get behind every, he's a, you know, he has, he's a fiery guy, but you see it comes from inside and it's, it's a personal deal for him. And, and it, for him, it was always respect your teammates, respect the people around you, respect the game. And if you did those three things, then, then everything should work out. Okay. And, and, um, and not everything is perfect. Not everything in the program is perfect. But at the end of the day, when, when you respect others around you, respect your teammates and you respect the game, then, then you have a better locker room. And, um, and then I think one thing I will say is, and I said this the other day in our staff meeting, that Parcells, when I played for him, always said, when your best players are the best people in the locker room, then you have something special. Well, so that's, that's for special. us, we had Curtis Martin, one of the best people, <clears throat> the best human beings you'll ever yeah. be around. And he was by far one of the best running backs, the Jets, if not the best the Jets have mm-hmm. ever had. Obviously, he's a Hall of Famer. So so when you have that combination of the best person character and the best person player, then then you have something special because now everybody wants to be like that guy. And those are the kind of guys you want to hit your wagon to. The guys that are, are great people on and off the field and can lead and and carry themselves in a manner that you want to be representing you as an organization, a program, or whatnot. And so, so absolutely. And there are the coaches have to buy into it. You know, you don't have to buy into every day's a motivational speech, and you don't have to be the rah rah guy all the time. But you have to buy into what the program, what the coach is trying to build within the program. Because if you don't buy in, your position group's not going to buy in. They have to see right through the, the falsehood and the yeah. fakeness of it. And it's just like and, and kids know when you're lying. They just know. They know when when you're just kind of going through the motions. And it's not just kids, it's like particularly football players and athletes in general, they know when a coach doesn't like it or just saying it because a coordinator's telling them this is what we're going to do. And um there's the whole idea of fake it till you make it deal that doesn't work in, yeah, in, no in a football program and 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 players will sniff you out in a heartbeat if you're not being realistic with them or being honest with them i think it's interesting um <clears throat> you mentioned that that parcells quote and i could see that really resonated with you uh lamont also when he said that but you mentioned curtis martin being one of the best guys in the locker room when i was with the steelers he was uh playing at pit still and we did a, a joint uh, event one time and i mean obviously i knew of him whatever and i just remember back then even in college being that impressed with with the kid and how he held himself and and how good a guy he was and i would think you know lamar you know, you you are the OG of, of player development, and what you're trying to do really, I think, plays into uh, that quote of you're trying to develop the people in the in the locker room to be the best they can be. Because if they are, then that just permeates itself. And I mean, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, Kevin, and and I know when I came in, I mean, 
you're you're just looking for somebody not to completely attach to, but you're just looking for a friendly face and somebody that wants to maybe take you under uh, your wing a little bit. I know for me, uh, for that first year for me with the Steelers, uh, it was t the late Tunch Ilkin who was just yeah. a fabulous human being. Was there anybody that, that that took you under Kevin that you remember? There was, uh, you know, Howard Ballard was an offensive tackle with us at the time. He just came over. I think he was like the first million dollar offensive tackle in the NFL once the free agency started and the new salary cap system. And then Ray Donaldson was a 12 year vet who actually played here with the Colts before he became a free agent. And then the next year was Jim Sweeney. So those are three guys when I first came yeah. in the league that really kind of like, I would watch them and I wasn't really attaching myself to them, but I would pay attention to them. And it's mm -hmm. like that guy's, that's what a professional is supposed to look like. And that's how he's supposed to carry himself. And then Jim Sweeney is a little bit more vocal about, Hey, young man, he <laughs> called me young guy or young man. Um, yeah, this is how you should do it. Or this is things you need to think about and stuff like that. And then there's other guys that you would see Stan Gilball was on, it was there with us. And, you know, in my fourth year was Warren moon. And I think here's the deal is, you don't just learn your fret your rookie year as you go through this business yeah. and i played a long time and you know you guys know as well there's always something you can learn from somebody else in that locker room i got yeah. to, i got to new york and benny testaverde was a veteran quarterback and watched his professionalism and how he how he took care of his business in the locker room but then how he treated people outside the building and um and then even you know as i got to be you know the, the 13 14 and 15 year guy you know, now you know you're one of the guys that they're looking at and you want to set a good example. And and this business and this league and this game is really built upon the foundation of all those that came before us. And I know it's a cliche thing to say, but it really is. You know, I'm sitting in this position now as an assistant offensive line coach who's a former player because guys like Howard Mudd did it. Howard and, Mudd, yeah. sure, and, yeah. you know, <clears throat> and, and, uh, Howard Mudd and Mike Munchak and guys like that who played at a very high level who transitioned into a coaching role because they had a love for the game and a respect for the game. They wanted other players to, to see that. And, and um, so that's something I'm always reminded of is that I'm here because there's other guys that, that kind of traveled the path before me and, and left the legacy for me to follow. And I wanted to do that as a player. And I also, now I'm trying to build that legacy as a coach and, it's because of those guys that came before me. And, you know, you know, Kevin, you, you hit on uh, several things, but the, uh, uh, a thread that goes through all that, you know, Herm Edwards uh, is a personal friend of our family. He's the reason why both Kevin and I got into the National Football League, uh, me being first with the Chiefs. And the thing about Herm is it's that consistency. And, and he tries to foster that just consistency. Um, and I think he that's probably from – Tony's a likeness the same way, Tony Dungy. Um, and, and you start seeing the coaches as he was an assistant coach with guys we had. Um, you know, I know uh, we came in, when I came in, we had just traded for Joe Montana, Marcus Allen. I mean, are you kidding me? In like one off season. So now you're bringing that to the Kansas City Chiefs. And then we're looking at Will Shields was a rookie. Okay, John yep. Alt, Dave Zott, Tim Grenard. But you start watching the consistency the, from the assistants from all because Marty had a lot of assistants um, uh, that were just like fantastic, but they were all consistent, man. Like Marty yep. used to always talk about that. You, the one thing that the players have one thing that's a telltale they're extremely instinctive and they yes. can tell. They, they can tell. If they ask you a question, sometimes you say, Lamont, players will ask you a question. And that's not even what they're trying to ask you. They just want to see your response. They want yeah. to see your face. And, and I think that when, when, when the vibe in the locker room becomes, hey, you know what? They're consistent. Okay, now yeah. I can go to, to, to Coach Mawai. Now, now I can go to ex maybe teammate because I've seen how they kind of live their life. They go about their jobs, right? Yeah. But uh, this business is, and, and that, you're right. This, it's a, this is a, this is a constant build in terms of you know identifying and and and, and establishing trust, right? Yep. Because, and I, and I can imagine in this day and age, because your instincts may tell you to trust something or not to trust something. You have social media right in front of you at your fingertips telling you the opposite. And you Absolutely. know how feelings are, right? So, so feelings, feel, your, our feelings can fool you. And if you're feeling a certain way, you're probably going to, you know, 
make a wrong choice, wrong choice. But um, yeah, man, it's it's uh, you know you've been around some great players. One of my brothers talk about the environment you guys created there uh, at the Jets, um, the winning culture, consistent winning culture, uh, the fans, which are you know they're iconic. They're Jets fans, right? <laughs> <laughs> We just got to just got to roll consistently not have say anything. <laughs> just got to roll with that one, but yeah. but uh, yeah, man. I, I uh, Kendall and I were talking earlier. You know, you say Kevin Mawai, and I was at your uh, your Hall of Fame induction, and I just said Will Shields, like like to be able to have in your, my career uh, a, a person like Will. Kevin has had you. Uh, that says a lot because we reference you guys in so many ways, like all the time. Um, yeah. uh, and to be honest with you, it's I, saw, I think it's pretty cool when it's an offensive lineman because it's not about the glory. It's not about the individualism. It's not about the stats. It's not about the flashy highlights. It's that consistent, let's go to work, let's do it the right way yeah. approach that I think is the anchor for, for any and all NFL franchises. Well, what I like about the word consistency, I think it fosters trust. And mm -hmm. I think – when coaches have players that are consistent, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what's going on in the outside world. They, everybody has bad days. Everybody has great days. And there's, you can't – it's hard to coach a guy that's living on peaks and valleys every day. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. what kind of mood is this guy in coming into the in the, into the locker room? And, you know, there's, there's times where, like, I lost my brother going into year three. And that was a tragic time for my life. It changed my life, you know, from – in a personal standpoint – but there was still an expectation that was that was from the outside world and from the coaching world that there was an expectation of level of how I needed to play, no matter how I felt emotionally. And so they, you have to learn how to deal with that. You know, I I've been married 29 years and I get in fights with my wife and, you know, I can't let that when I come in the locker room affect how I perform my job. Mm -hmm. Now, it's on my mind because that's what's important. But I also have a job to do. And so and I, that's just an extreme example. But I'm talking about coaches want to know what they got when they come in the locker room. What kind of player is this guy? Is he going to be this kind of even kill guy that no matter what happens, because I know I can trust guys because in the game, now you're going to have the ebbs and flow of the game. There's bad things that happen in the game and you got to be able to overcome them. And there's great things that come happen in the game, but you got to be able to bring yourself down to stay focused. And and that's what coaches want, players that are consistent. On the flip side of it, from players, we want to know when I'm sitting at my desk as a player and getting ready to take notes in this meeting room, I know I had a bad day of practice yesterday, mm -hmm. but am I going to have a coach to come in and drop bombs on me the whole time? Or he's going to come in here with a teacher's attitude and say, okay, this is what we did wrong. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to do. Or even recognize the fact that maybe something was off, not because of my game, but because of some external factor. And so as a coach, you're more than just, exes and those guys you become a mentor you become a teacher you become a counselor and you got to be able to read the room too when the something's not right in the room you got to be able to recognize that and and players expect the coaches to come in the same way like there's a consistency like if you're going to be a butthole coach be a butthole coach all the time at least yeah, i know correct, what you expect to exactly room. right if you're going to be a <clears throat> dog cusser and a yeller be, don't be that and then the next day try to be my buddy it's one or the other, but I can't go back and forth between both. Mm -hmm. And and so you then you take it off the field. And, and it, for where I'm at in this role now, you know, I think I work for a great GM, Chris Ballard, and a great head coach, Frank Wright. And we speak, we preach and speak character more than anything in this program. Like this guy might be a great player, but there's character issues. And that's something that when I was in college ball and now when I even when I talk to other people, is you guys don't understand how much time is invested into the character of the player before a team even drafts a player. And, and, and just for every year, there's a crop of guys that just don't get that. They think they're good enough just to be, cause they're a ball player. And, and some teams will take those guys, but if you have baggage coming with you, that baggage comes into our locker room and you know, you know, one bad apple ruins a whole bunch. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of yeast leavens the whole bread, and and so that's the mentality. Is I want to make sure that I want a great player, but I want a guy that fits great in the locker room environment that we're trying to build. And when you can do that, then you can have a great program. I know Kendall, you guys have you've been with Kansas City, where you had great teams, and you've been in Pittsburgh yeah. where they have great teams. I've been with the Jets and. 
and in the Titans where we had great chemistry with great players that were great people and that wins the games. Now, every now and then, you know, you just got dudes and you got Tom Brady's. I mean, that guy makes everybody better. Right. No matter what kind of, you know, and, yeah, yeah, no doubt. But, but the consistency part is it develops trust. I can trust you and you can trust me. And now I can put more on your plate as a coach, or I can, I can give you more of what I have as a player because of the consistency that we show one another. And, and, um, and that's, what's great. And then you go back to reference to Will Shields and, and guys like that, you know, and every coach has a once in a lifetime player, you know, and, and one day I'll have that hopefully. And, um, but if <laughs> the guys that I met, particularly offensive linemen that are hall of famers, if you just went around them outside of the game, they're just good dudes. They're just, they're good, just dudes, good guys. <laughs> they in, in our life, I tell my daughter all the time, if you're going to get married, you better marry an offensive lineman <laughs> because they are natural born servants yeah. and leaders and, and they protect They're protectors. It's in their blood. And that's what we do. And, you know, nobody cares about an offensive line stats. I mean, unless you got sacks or you know, tackles for losses. And so ultimately when a guy like Will Shields is, is playing ball, what he cares about is his quarterback staying clean and his running back, you know, Priest Holmes running for 150 yards a game. For me, is the more times Curtis Martin got 100 yards, the better I felt about it, you know. And and in both cases, we we stacked up enough games like that that it put us in the Hall of Fame. And and I'm fortunate I I blocked for a running back that's in the Hall of Fame, so it made my job easy a little easier. But um, but at the end of the day, and you said you were at my speech, it was never about me. I mean, right. I yeah. I I had to perform in a way where I felt like everybody there was watch me. That's the ego you have to play at a high level in this business. But at the same time, I never played to say, hey, look at me. I played because I love the game. And I wanted those people who were supposed to score and who are supposed to throw passes and those supposed to run the ball. I wanted them to be successful because when – I'm successful. They're successful, and everybody's happy, and um, and that's what ultimately what being the teammates all about. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in here real quick, Lamont, and you can go. But I just want to say this, um, you, Lamont. He brought up Tom Brady a little bit ago, and I, Ke uh, Kevin, I don't know if you would remember this, but in 2005 in the Pro Bowl, we're in the locker room, and we're a couple days in, and Tom got there late. And um, I, I think because they've been in the Super Bowl, the way things worked out back then. But I remember he came in and a lot of us naturally were trying to get the helmets signed. And and Lamont, he 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 just kind of looked at us all. He's like, come on. He was just he was just kind of frustrated with it. He didn't want any part of it. And Kevin, you, you probably don't remember this, but you you stood up and you just looked at Tom and said, Tom, you know the deal. Sign the helmets. <laughs> and kind of funny. Tom just fell in the line and he started signing the helmets. And yeah, signing helmets. I, 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 I don't, you probably don't remember, but it, it was just like that. That was the unwritten code that no, no matter what somebody asked for, you just sign it because you're all there as a team. I'm, I'm curious, Kevin, and maybe you can expand on this, Lamont. But Kevin, a, a lot of people may not know or remember that you're an NFLPA uh, president uh, for a while, as voted on by the players. Lamont, I can think of no bigger honor uh, than to be voted that by your peers in something that's so very important. And I, I'm just curious, uh, Kevin, if you can talk about what you think uh, it, it is about you that that made people uh, want to follow you. Yeah, I I don't know. I you know I, there's a, a thought out there that people are born leaders, um, and there, and then you can develop leaders. I believe that there's innate characteristics in certain people that allow them to feel comfortable to be put in those roles. Um, I've always been that way. I was a fourth grade class president, you know, because I was willing to speak up and say, I mean, as if, you know, we ever did, I, like it's your turn to take, you know, to race the, the, the chalkboards, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I just, I don't believe that you can take a guy that's just not bent that way and say, you're going to be the leader of this team. I just don't think you do. I think there's guys that have an innate ability to do that and are and then match it with somebody who's willing who has ability but's willing to do it. And and for me, case in point for the NFL PA, I'd served on the board as a rep for I, I think it was eight years or something like that, and just felt like it was important enough for me that that 
to, to, to represent my players, but to make the game better. And, and I think when people saw me work within the committees I worked with or whatever, they're like, you know what, this is a, Kevin's not doing this for him. They're just doing this because for the game. And, and I would speak up and, and, and I have a tendency when I feel strongly about something, I'm going to stand up and say, this is what I believe. And if you don't agree with me, I'm okay with that, but this is how I feel. And this is, you know, and I think, I think the funny thing is players <clears throat> hated me as a, like a lot of teammate uh, players hated me as a player but they respected me as a person and because they didn't like the way I played the game. And that's kind of what, what the funny part for me was. And then I get elected as a, as a PA president and they're like, well, I hate playing against him, but I know what this is, what he's about. You know, when he says he's going to do something, this is what he says he's going to do. Or, but ultimately for me, it was, I wasn't doing it for myself. And I think that's what everybody saw in me that, a lot of people didn't know in 2008 when I ran for president that the day before or the, the first day of those meetings, I told the executive committee I wasn't going to run, that I was actually stepping away from the union just because oh, wow. I felt like my time was up because I'd been there so long. My kids are getting older. And but there's just something in me that gnawed at me and and told me to run. And I had to sit down and I met with Gene and, and a couple of Clark Gaines and some other guys. And every guy even played Jeff Saturday and Kevin Carter. And they're like, you're the guy, you're the one who has to run. And, and, and so when, when you have that and knowing those guys are behind you, you feel obligated, not for yourself, but for those guys, because you know, they are expecting you to do that. And for me, I was always willing <laughs> to live up to the challenge. Um, and, and I took, I took pride in it and I took pride in knowing that no matter what happened at the end of the day, it wasn't going to be for me. It was to make the game better. And I, and I think I did that. And um, so I, I do carry that um, with a badge of honor somewhat. And now that I'm in the coaching world, I'm, I'm on the coach side. You kind of walk a fine line because I will always be a player and I will always be the past president of the NFLPA, but I work for management. And so – you, there's a fine line, but ultimately, if I'm teaching players the business and I'm teaching them the game, then that's what really matters the most. And if this game, this organization, the league is better for me at being a coach, then that's all that matters to me. And um, and so it, it was it was a great experience. It was a learning experience for me. I learned a lot about myself during that time, but it, it was a lot of pressure because I know that decisions I was making would affect not just the 2000 current players at the time of any given year I was serving, but it would affect the players in the future of the game. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the, at the, the 30 <clears throat> foot view of the whole thing, it's hard to look in the mirror because you're not doing it for the guy in the mirror. You're doing it for everybody that's in the arena. And, um, and that's, that was a challenge that this is never going to be about me. And anytime you take a leadership role, it's never about you as a leader. It should never be about the guy sitting in the head seat. It should be about all the people that put you in the seat. And unfortunately, in every level of leadership, there's always somewhere there where there are always going to be people looking at it selfishly and not selflessly. And and um, so that's just, I don't know, but I've always been, I'm a, I'm a second born son of a military, career military sergeant. And, and so, you know, and, and I saw my dad lead and I, and it was just, something that I admired about him and and something that I just felt like I was always going to be that guy. I'm never going to be the last in line to start a drill. I was always going to be the first in line. I'm never going to be the guy following somebody else. And I tell people, if you think you're a leader, look behind you. If nobody's following you, you're just taking a long, low swim walk. And, um, but the idea to lead is to encourage, to inspire, and get somebody and get others to find something within themselves that they might not thought they had for themselves. And, um, and hopefully I do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, you know, Kevin, a lot of times, you know, I've, I've found, um, you know, people in, in that have those traits, um, you know, they run, they, they run, they see a problem, they run to it. Most people run away. You know, the, the, the people who are true leaders, they're going, they're, they're trying to find a way to get to it. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, the people in people always ask me about, you know, player development, the role, and you have a fantastic person right there. And David Thornton is one of my, one of my closest guys has done it the right way for yeah. a long time. Um, but you know, people say, well, that's, you know, that there must be interesting. He's like, you know what? People don't just innately run to people's problems. 
and and we do and we have to yeah. uh, you know because it's about them right and and sometimes I, when, I, when I, we watch games um and you get these guys to set to sunday they've had a week of issues right and, and you're able to work with teammates or you know some other coaches to get them there to the point you watch a man play i've watched so many men play with heavy hearts yeah it's amazing I man it's 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 just you know, sometimes I would be on the sideline tearing up because I know, like, when this through. game is over, what that man's getting yeah. ready to face. Yep. Right? Um, so you've been that person. Um, but, but I do think that, um, you know, uh, your role at the, at the PA, you know, it's two parents in the relationship, you know. And so yeah. – and, and both of them aren't always right, right? But there's yep. this line you talked about. Now you're on the, the coaching management side – um, and and you're you're still learning. Your perspective is a little different now, Mike, because you know over here it could be better. And and so, but you're again, you're still probably being a president, right? Because you're, yeah. you're you're representing the union because it, it is about it is about the game. It is about you know the, the integrity of this game going forward. And so there's always something to learn about that. I used to call the players, uh, the PA in the league, like this 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 divorced parent managing the kids routine right yeah so, you know but just it's but they, but both parents love you they want the best for you right and yep. so we have to be able to be here's this word again it's consistent and the reason yep. why those guys said no you can't not step down is because your consistency says you need to be the guy well i i i enjoyed it in hindsight I, in hindsight, I look back on that experience and think how much I learned as a person, how much I grew as a man mm -hmm. and um, and grew as a leader. And uh, you, you mentioned Dave Thornton. You know, we were teammates together at the Tennessee Titans, and we were brought in to help change the culture of that program. Him, my, uh, mm -hmm. myself, Chris Hope, <clears throat> David Givens, who unfortunately had a career-ending injury his first year there. But, but Dave and I talk about it still to this day. It's like, yeah, man, you remember when we first got here in Tennessee and what we did and how we changed this program around? We went from like an average team to going thirteen and three and you know playing for the first round bye and and that kind of stuff and and so you know I just at the end of the day, like I said, it's it's never it's never about yourself. It's, it can never be about you and and I think for for a lot of people it's not. And then you mentioned the players. Yeah, and, and, and Lamont, you guys do a great job. There's, like you said, there's so much that every individual player goes through. Um, we had some tragedies in our, and just on our team alone last year. You know, and um, you know, a player of ours lost a, a lost a child. Um, and I don't know the other things, but I know there's always somebody who's dealing with like family issues. There's always right. somebody dealing with financial issues. <clears throat> there's always somebody who lost somebody, or somebody's in the hospital or sick, and and people on the outside world because I do my wife and I joke around we live in a bubble we live in a, the NFL bubble and people don't understand our life yeah. and just go play well for six days a week that's what we're trying to we're trying yeah. just to get to Sunday yeah. because Sunday yeah. is the day that we we don't think about it you know mm -hmm. that's the day that's and my time as the NFL PA president was some of the most stressful times of my life in my career because I was worried about the negotiations and trying to find a new executive director all during the season. And so mm -hmm. for me, the three hours I had on the football field <clears> of <throat> practice every day, that was my, that was my oasis away from the desert. Mm -hmm. And that was my ability to just kind of just, this is just get this off my mind. Cause I know as soon as I step off this field, I'm going to be on a two hour conference call, or I'm going to be on a three hour call with attorneys or I got to travel to DC on a Tuesday afternoon to have meetings with somebody, but I got to be back on Wednesday morning for yeah, practice. Yeah. And so, it, and then, and then when I got the game days, and and a lot of players think like this, some don't, but I think a lot of them should. Sundays is your day. Yeah. That, as a player, Sundays is your day. And I would tell my coaches, don't talk to me on game days unless it has something to do with happening on the field, unless it has something to do with us making adjustments. This is my day, and it's my day to go do the thing I love to do more than anything was to play ball, and I turned it loose. And I just – and for me, for like three hours, three to five hours on a Sunday, it was a lethargic thing for me to get away from all the stress that takes place outside of our bubble. And um, 
But no one, no one, as soon as I stepped off the field, took a shower, got back in my house. I got, <laughs> I got two kids. I got to deal with my, you know, I got to call my mom and dad and I got to deal with this other stuff. But, but that's, and, and I will say, I commend uh, you, Lamont, and Kevin, who was good, great when I was with him in tennis in, in New York, David Thornton. Um, they helped us to get to Sundays. Correct. And, and I think, and I hope that coaches around the NFL staffs, are like our staff where they see the value in your role to the team because because their stuff i mean you're 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 firemen you put out fires and that coaches don't even know about and unless we absolutely have to and 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 every organization to have to have that guy um you put that burden on gm or head coach or the coaching staff in general then it just weighs everybody down so you're the first line of defense to help put those fires out and and ultimately I think out of anybody in the football building, the players trust you guys in your role more than anybody else in the building. And like even today, I still go sit down the days off. So, dude, man, I just had this going on today at my house. I'm a former player and I'm a coach. Sure. And by the outside measurements of this world, I've got everything going on. But man, I you know I got the issues just like everybody else does, and I need somebody to talk to, and and I got I need people to get me to Sunday. Yeah. And yeah. and fortunately, I have a strong marriage to my wife, and she helps me get to Sundays. Sometimes she's part of the thing reason why I'm sitting in Dave's office. But um, I mean, think I'm about right. it. Think about it, though. You you played you played all these years. You know, you 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 can do really anything you want. You decided that I want to kind of go back down the football road. College is one thing, but then you go back in the NFL and. It's the same thing all over again, right? Yeah. Because time yeah. is time, right? At least to the player, yeah. you got a chance to go home, right? When you're a coach, um, you're not going home. Right? No. Uh-uh. I mean, it's- and, so, and that's the biggest deal with coaches. Like, you don't ever see your wife during the season. Yeah. You just know from training camp until last your last game of the season, 21 weeks later, you're going to have three days a week where you're going to see your family and that's yeah. it. And, and you're right. I'm fortunate. I choose this <clears throat> and I've, I've chosen it. I don't need the money. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've chosen it because it's a challenge to myself. And, ulti- and that's the last thing like the, for players that trans, I know you guys heard, I heard you guys talking about players transitioning out of the game. And the hardest part for a player to do is become a former player because they don't know anything else and and for me it, it you know i made transition because i was purposeful and, and that's a lot of a lot of guys don't understand the idea of being purposeful not just doing things to be doing things but why are you doing things for me i transitioned out of the game because i weaned myself away from the game i went from coach playing in the game to volunteer coaching at vanderbilt to coaching at high school for a year to to purposefully doing nothing for an entire calendar year and it was purposeful. So now I know the only reason why I'm not doing anything is because I I've made it a purpose to be here with my family and my wife in the transition to a move that we had, and then getting back into the game. It was a purposeful move for me because I trained guys for three or four years, and I saw guys starting to develop and going to the NFL and watching them play in the NFL. And I was like, okay, I can do one get one on one, five on five, but I want to take a group of five guys and help them become the offensive line that leads the league in rushing and leads the league in the in least amount of sacks. And so for the last seven years, I've been purposeful in the steps I've taken. I've taken, done internships. I've done Bill Walsh program. I've done training camps. I've done, you know, I've done uh, the quality control. And now I'm assistant line coach. I'm not there yet, but I have a goal in mind. So, and I think that's something that I would encourage former players to do is understand that your goal doesn't, your life doesn't end at the end of your retirement. It just begins then. And so what, and everybody should be working towards what's next. And for me, I didn't know what that was until later on. I I had kids and stuff. I found out two years after I want to be a coach. Okay. What's the next step? I'm not just going to walk into an NFL locker room. So I played 16 years. I should be the line coach. Uh, I knew better than that because there's so much I didn't know about the game as a player and so now here i am eight years into this process and i'm now the assistant line coach hoping that one day i'd get my own room and and a lot of guys can't it's hard for them to think that way because they've always been the top dog they've never had to be 
the underling or the, the ingenue or whatever you want to call it, the protege, you know, they've always been the guy. And, and that's a hard transition for a lot of guys to make. But for us, it was a purposeful move in every step that I did, which helped me transition from a player to the role I'm in now, because I saw the end in sight, but never lost sight of where I was to at, the, at that point. And, and uh, you know, we we talk about climbing a mountain a lot of times. And, and for us, you can get so discouraged when you're looking up at the peak of the mountain thinking you got to climb all the way up there because all you see is the distance you got to cover. But the reality of it is the only part, it's the most important part is the next step. And the next step is get my right foot in front of the other. And a lot of times and that's, you need to keep looking up to make sure that you're going in the right direction. But at the end of the day, you got to take care of what's in front of you right now. And for some guys, that's just take care of their mental health. For other guys, that's taking care of their kids. For other guys, it's taking care of their marriage. That's what's most important now. And, and it's okay. What's the next step for me to get to where I want to go? Well, okay. I have to take this class or I got, I've taken every exam that the NFHA was the national federation of high school sports has because I was going into coaching. I said, if I go into college, high school coaching, I got to have all these deals. So I took all the exams that I got. Then the next thing was, okay, I don't want to coach in high school. I want to coach in college. What do I got to do now? Well, now I got to study NCAA rules. All right. So I studied that. So I take the recruiting, <clears throat> take the recruiting exam so that I can go on the road and recruit guys. And from there, okay, I need to learn the offense to do it. Okay, I need to learn offense. Well, how do we call these formations? I need to study the formations. And, and guys don't think that small. They always want to see the big picture but they forget about all the tiny little bricks that make that wall. And, and, and so my encouragement for guys is like, keep your eye where on the here and the now always peek up to where you want to go, but know that uh, a foundation is built one little brick at a time. And too many times guys want to have the palace and forget about the foundation. And, and, uh, so I, don't, I just ran it for about five minutes, but um, <laughs> you're good. Hey, yeah. you know what, Kevin? I will say this. You know, in in the thousands of players I've been fortunate enough to be around, you know, I would I, I, I like to leave guys with with this. You know, vulnerability is your friend. Vulnerability yes. will allow you to ask for help. Yep. Right, when you don't know how, and I think as guys transition, it's 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 be, re, being reacquainted the right way with vulnerability because. <clears throat> this game uh, uh, gets that out of you because it, it it's going to tell you that it's over at some point, right? And and so you when you when, when you can make vulnerability your friend, okay? Like I said, it allow it allow you to open up your eyes, uh, your heart, right? To 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 programming mean, between the between the player association between the National Football League, this is the only organization in the world that has all of these resources for various areas of growth for their memberships like nobody Absolutely. Does. like this no. is believable but the number one thing that i've seen is is guys don't really understand vulnerability they think that's a weakness and it's actually a gateway to a major strength i agree with yeah, you cool. i tell yeah. people it's like some people are guarded and my wife is a very guarded person i just tell everyone i think man I don't know how to do this. I don't know that. Um, I struggle with this, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, and, and it's helped because like I'm faith driven. I know you guys are too. Yeah. And so, so faith has a lot for me, has a lot to do with it. You know, I mean, I can't hide from the, <laughs> the one God that I serve, I can't hide from him. So I'm just vulnerable. I just tell right. people like, look, man. And here's the other thing is like, you want to know something about me? Go on the internet. Like I, go on the internet. It did. That my whole life is on there. I mean, you, my cell phone's on there. My address is on there. And, and my wife's like, well, you can't be putting that on Twitter. It's like, why not? Everybody else can see it anyways. <laughs> and, and now I own the balls, like the most secret parts of my life, but, but I struggle with the desire to want to be liked. It, it bothers me when I feel like someone doesn't like me or, or they have a beef. It, it <clears> bothers <throat> me to my core because I just want people to like me. And, and that's a vulnerability because mm -hmm. now right. you become a people pleaser. And mm -hmm. so you, to, I don't want to be a people pleaser. I want to do things the right way, but I got to be okay with people not liking me because I'm not doing it their way. And that was one of the struggles I had as an NFL PA president. I had to do things the right way. And if you didn't like me, it bothered me. But at the end of the day, I knew where my heart was. I knew I had to do the right. And so there's convictions. You got to live by your convictions, but you got to understand where your weaknesses are. And, and when you're willing to do that, then you find a good balance. And, um, 
but my life is open book. People are like, I'm going to do speaking stuff. And they're like, well, is anything off limits? I said, yeah, just no, ask. Yeah, said, yeah. it's really not. Just ask me. And I'll, you know, and I'll even answer questions I don't want to answer, but I answer them in a way to, that will look, tell you that I'm just not going to answer that fully, but how I handle situations. And, and, um, but I just, to me, it's just, it's easier to live your life that way. It really is. You go to bed at night, right? There's no doubt about it. I mean, yeah, like my brother passed away. I dealt with that. How did I find my faith? Yeah, I got called a dirty Christian as a player. Yeah, you're right. I'm not perfect, but thank God, you know, thankfully the guy that I serve was is. Yeah. And, you know, and people don't like the way I play. Well, my coaches do. That's all that matters to me. And, and so <laughs> I had something to back up everything that people didn't yeah. like about me. And but there's things I don't like about myself. And and the, those closest to me know what those things are. And you got to be willing to tell people, I don't like this about me. And then it's people like like you, Lamont, in your office. When I sit down with Dave, Dave, I'm struggling. With this. I don't like this. I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like this man I'm becoming. Well, who in your life is willing to tell you, like, okay, this is how we're going to change that. Or this yeah. is how we're going to fix that. Or this is how we're going to get around that. And guys are afraid. They, guys are willing to take coaching on the football field 100% of the time. But are so difficult to take coaching in life because they don't want other people to know what they're dealing with. And and I tell people to do, but I'll I can see a guy come in this room and sit here. And I can see it in his face, and you can ask him. He's like, I know I'm good. I said, dude, I'm, I'm telling. I know you're not good, you know. And and I, the one of the greatest examples I share with people, when my rookie year, I was struggling with my family. My family asked for for a, a sum of money that was probably a whole lot larger than what any you know. I mean, like we all like a lot of our players deal with, and. The, Eugene Robinson, a, a well-respected player in the league, asked me how my rookie year was going. Oh, it's okay, things are good, you know, whatever. Transitions are good. He goes, he goes, how's your how's your family life? I was like, wife's great, whatever. And and then just kind of goes, what about back home? I just kind of like, yeah. He goes, and the first thing he asked me is, how much money did your family ask for? I mean, he knew, he wow. knew, he saw it, he knew. <laughs> and the reason why he knew is because probably he went through it, or other players yeah. have done with it. But he knew, but the thing was, he was willing to ask and he was willing to put it out there. Like, I know what you're going through. And and so for us that are sitting in these roles now, we have to be able to have our eyes wide open to be able to see those things in our players. Absolutely. Because sometimes you get so caught up in what you're doing, you don't even pay attention to what the guy next to you is doing. And for me, that's what coaching is all about. It's, it's about understanding what's in your room and understanding the individuals in your room, but knowing that something's off about him today and I need to get to the bottom of it. Cause I'm going to make, it's going to make him a better man, which is going to make him a better person, which is going to make him a better player. And ultimately everything has an ultimatum at the end of it. But the reality, the, the truth is it goes back to the person. I want to make him a better person because when he's a better person than everybody around him is better. And um, Eugene, Eugene Robinson was one of those guys in my life. And, you know, I shared that with him 20 years down after the fact, but, uh, but I remembered that he took his time out to ask me the hard question and, and I was willing to open up to him about it. Man, that's so awesome. Kevin, um, we could sit here and talk for hours. Maybe we'll bring you on again, but I know uh, this is no easy task for you as a coach to be able to take this time and, and speak with us today. So I, I really appreciate it. And from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate your vulnerability, vulnerability today. It was fabulous. No, I thank you guys for having me. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Lamont, I appreciate you. You are the, a, a legend in the player <laughs> engagement community. And, and I, I do thank Kevin more. And and I don't know if you knew this now, but Kevin's the one who encouraged me to go to grad school while I was playing. Wow. And uh, because of him, you know, I went, I got my master's degree he, through his encouragement. And he actually is because of him, I got inducted to LSU's Hall of Fame. Because uh, he's like, well, when you get, you're get, you already in LSU's Hall of Fame. I said, no, I'm going to get into Pro Football Hall of Fame before I get into LSU's. And then hmm. I didn't know it. But that year, he nominated me at LSU. And a year later, I got inducted to LSU's Hall of Fame. So wow. you guys you guys play a lot bigger role than just babysitting players. And, uh, and it's meaningful to us as former players and current players. Kendall, I always admire the way you handle yourself. You're a leader. Um, you know, I know that's what you teach and that's what you do. And just keep going, man. Live the good life. And uh, – Keep fighting a good fight. Appreciate it. All right, guys. G A O U A X. Go Tigers. <laughs> Go Tigers. You guys take care. Thanks for having me. All right, Kevin. Take, take care. care. Take care, guys.
Okay, Lamont, that Whoa. that's impressive. That is one impressive human being. Is that phenomenal? I mean, just that that's what our listeners, that that's why we do this. Because yeah. that's that's beyond the game. Like right there, that's beyond the game, behind the scenes, slowing it down again. Another one coming on and just putting it out there, man. Um uh, pro football is hard. Um yeah, and it goes so much deeper than what we see. The culmination is on on game day. Like it's it's so much deeper than that, man. Um, so that was. Yeah, awesome. yeah. I didn't want to put him on the spot, and especially since he's a coach, and as he said, he does walk a fine line because he he works for management now, and he used to be in, you know the leader of the players. But I can remember September 11th, uh, you know, and everything happened with the towers, and. Uh, we had a conference call that, that all the players were invited, uh, all the reps were invited to be on. And uh, I'll tell you right now, Kevin Kevin con- took control of that meeting. Of of, mm. I'll just say he took control of it. And that was with the, all the owners and, and, and some of us on here as player reps. And that was a person that, as he, as he mentioned, he let people know what he was thinking and, and what was going to go on from their aspect there in New York and everything. And, uh, he, he's just amazing. And I think he brought it up a, a pretty good point also. Number one, kudos to you and, and your brother and everybody else in uh, the position. I mean, just talking about how important you guys are and what you do uh, for the teams. And that's something that I think has come to light now. But you're the one that started it, man. You started this, you know, decades ago. And uh, you should be commended for that. That's a pretty cool deal. And it's got to feel good hearing it from him as well. Well, you know, Kendall, I've and I and I always, you know, my brother's the same way. You know, it, it's we we were allowed to to be involved with you guys. I mean, nobody just walks in and just starts working with the players. I mean, and, and trying to make a difference in a person's life. I mean, you guys allowed us uh, uh, for years to be a part of not 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 just the league, but the locker room, but your fabric of your life, the actual little threads of your life, um, uh, sharing relationships, the family, the mother, the father, I mean, all these things. And you know what, man, we, you're in this role, you're in a, a true servant's role because it is not about me. I mean, people say, Lamont, well, you know, um, do they ever say thank you? They may not say thank you, those words, but they, p- players have shown me in so many ways, if you're oh, looking, yeah. Yeah. they show you that they appreciate you, right? And, 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 and to get them to come to work every day, even that in itself is huge. I just once they in the building, I disappear. Right? Yeah. No, I I loved what he said that it's it's not about looking in the mirror. It's it's not for the person in the mirror. It's for the oh, people man. in the arena, uh, and that's what a leader does. And and he is a true leader, and it, it does it exudes from him. He he that we could have gone into so much more because I oh, interviewed yeah. him, my book. Yeah, he's phenomenal. He, he, you know, he is phenomenal. So, okay, well, hey, it has been another great episode, one of our best. Lamont, as always, I appreciate you allowing me to go on this journey with you. It's been fabulous, and I can't wait to see you next time. He's Lamont Winston. I'm Kendall Gammon, and this has been Beyond the Game.